we put very, very hot water on milk, on plastic, you'll burn some of that protein fat onto the plastic and you create a biofilm. So lukewarm water or cold water to rinse off the milk. And then at that point, often I'm just leaving them in an IBC with a one in 1000 solution of parasitic. Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this week's episode, I'm joined by vet Martin Kavna, Business Development Manager with Munster Bovine, to discuss how to prevent and treat calf diseases. Martin, you're very welcome. What are the main health risks in calves being purchased at the moment? Uh, a lot of these calves are coming to us, you know, two, two weeks plus three weeks, that kind of age group. Um, and the issue for these calves are generally over the highest risk of the scour period of those rotavirus crypto scours. That's not to say that they can't bring them with them and get stressed and run through a scour period. So when we're purchasing our calf, the one thing we want to check for first, how dehydrated are they when they're landing into the yard? And there's some simple tests you can ask your vet to give you a hand. But a very simple one that I use is what I call a skin test. You pick up some of the skin on the side of the neck and um, you just see how elastic it is. In other words, will it will it flatten back again very quickly? So pick up the skin and if it flattens back very quickly. That calf is well hydrated. It takes a bit of time to do that. We're short some water and those calves will need some electrolyte coming in your door. So the recommendation is check them out, uh, get some fluids into them and get them fed pretty, uh, pretty lively. So that's the dehydration one. The other big risk is calves at this age getting pneumonia. And that really is down to um, how their environment is managed in terms of how cold it is, what sort of drafts they're in and whether they've been exposed to viruses or not. And in relation to the calf scour as an issue for calves that might be coming in younger ages than that, that might be moving even farm to farm, what would be the correct treatment protocol for calves that you've dealt with? Okay, look, so one of the most important things in the prevention of scour overall is is that calf has had enough colostrum. Um, And in general, we kind of look at that figure of around three to four litres of colostrum in the first hour of life. So we follow that three to one rule that AHI have three litres first uh, first within two hours in that first feed of milk. So we're, we're depending on the farmer, the dairy farmer getting that done. And sometimes they can do some blood testing on those calves at you know five days to seven days or, or one day to about seven days of age and check out the protein levels and make sure they're getting enough colostrum so let's assume they have got that and so if my calf is coming to me dehydrated or has scoured those young calves the key thing is getting fluid in so to to, to replace the fluid loss so we try and feed uh, a feed of electrolytes two liters of a well-balanced electrolyte your vet can advise you and then a feed of milk you know five six hours later then a feed of electrolytes, then a feed of milk. Calves' appetite may be very poor here. So um, we, if, if the calf is not drinking properly, um, uh, it may need to be chewed with electrolytes, but we do not tube milk. But we'll always offer them a feed of milk while they have diarrhea because that provides the energy and the nutrition for the calf. So unfortunately, you've got to put in the work in those initial days with, with scour, animals may need to be fed uh, four times okay so electrolyte milk electrolyte milk try not to mix the electrolytes with, with milk and the main reason is is that we're not replacing fluid you're still giving the same amount of fluid and you're hopeful that the calf will take it on board so really we want to try and get these extra electrolyte feeds into these calves uh, giving calves antibiotics at this point is really again that's a veterinary decision if we see blood or calves of temperatures we, we'd certainly recommend antibiotics, but quite a few calves with viral scour don't need them unless they have a secondary infection. Uh, but one thing that's very useful here is an anti-inflammatory, some type of injection or treatment to control their temperature and make them feel better. So again, have a chat with your vet about that, but that really helps. And I'd always add heat to their environment. So these calves are not burning their nutrition as well as they should. And we want to try and warm them up a little bit and a, re- and a, you know, a deep, dry, a dry bed. So that's the key thing. And you mentioned earlier the importance of the environment and probably calf housing. Can you talk through some of the steps that farmers could take to reduce disease and infection? Okay, so 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 Catherine, we could probably spend about four weeks talking about calf housing, and everybody there's lots of uh, opinions and variations. And I'm often asked to design the best calf house. And really, in this situation, we're looking at uh, there's so many variables, and you have to look at the site you're on. So. Also, a lot of us have the buildings we have. We're not going to go out and build a new calf shed. Um, But there's some common principles. And if we follow some of the common principles, we'll probably deal with it 
the vast majority of the issues that are uh, within environment. Dry bed, number one, quantities, quantities of straw on a well-drained floor. So however, whatever we can do to improve the drainage will, will help any calf house get the bedding in. If a calf can nest, certainly up to three weeks of age, four weeks of age, they can nest in, the, in that bedding, they'll maintain their temperature and the optimum temperature for a calf to grow in that phase, up, certainly the baby calf, but even that calf up to a month old, we like to keep them at that 15 degrees, you know, uh, temperature, uh, 15 degrees Celsius minimum if we can, in their bed. Okay, so in the younger calf, even higher. So making sure that the, the bed is dry. The next thing we want to keep it free of draft. So the problem is with most of our calf rearing accommodation, the only moving parts are doors. Um, and they're at risk of, of draft because the wind outside is creating the air movement. So anything that creates excessive air movement inside at the calf level. So when I'm above about half a meter per second, I can create a draft and chill for calves at bed level where they spend about 80 percent of their time. So we want to cut down the level of draft while maintaining some air movement, which is a real challenge. And that can be achieved sometimes by using canopies over the back of the pen. So cuts the downdraft so that, so the calf is in a neutral wind area, but they're getting fresh air as such within the shed. So we need to be careful of that and also recognizing that baby calves don't push air out the top of these sheds. Uh, they don't generate enough heat. So often what we call stack effect may not work very effectively in some sheds. So it's the wind hitting the side of the shed will do it. So if it's too open, it creates, it creates a problem. If it's too closed, it creates a problem. And I see quite a few people have turned to Yorkshire boarding, which is an overlapped board, which allows in quite a lot of air, about 25 percent void. Uh, these and they're and they're very good for systems where air getting air in is difficult. But also remember that if you have a very high wind or you have a high sight for a calf house or there's a, you know, it's facing the prevailing wind, you often can get draft through them. So you, you may have to have Yorkshire boarding on one side of your shed and vintage cheating on, on, on the other to control the airflow in and out. It really differ from farm to farm, Martin. Yeah, Catherine, it's a real problem. And, and I think th this is why it's very hard. And I, and I worry when people are very prescriptive about this. You've really got to stand on the farm, see the shed, see how the prevailing wind works. And that will often dictate how that how that shed works to the point that some sheds we close down completely and put in a positive pressure tubing system into, into it. And then that's not suitable for all sheds. So each each shed uh, position will influence what you do with it. But what we can do, dry floor, canopies, shelter, um, it, it, those are key things that we can actually do straight away in any environment. Hygiene is very important as well, Martin. What advice have you for listeners? Yeah, hygiene. And we often can get, and, and funny enough, when I've, when I've, when I've worked abroad, um, it's interesting, like calf health is a problem internationally. It's not just, and in Ireland, we often associate it because we have this massive burst of calves in the season environment and we get huge infection pressure. So we're quite unique internationally, but calf health is an issue internationally. And a common thread is actually managing um, the hygiene of the feeding utensils and the basic hygiene of the environment that the calf is living in. So one, if we look at all the utensils we put in a calf or put around a calf, and keeping them clean. We need systems that are easy to use, uh, you know, very easy for you to get through washing the dishes pr uh, pretty quickly, and particularly when we're using kind of deep feeders and multiple teeth feeders and so on. So I'm inclined to use cold water systems. We use I I uh, IBCs where we take the top off, have them plumbed in so we get a lot of fresh cold water put into these IBCs. And so we rinse off all the milk and cold. So if we put very, very hot water on milk, on plastic, you'll burn some of that protein fat onto the plastic and you create a biofilm. So lukewarm water or cold water to rinse off the milk. And then at that point, often I'm just leaving them in an IBC with a one in 1000 solution of parasitic and it, it, you sanitize the product and do that once a day. Um, if we need a deep clean, then you're into rinsing it off and then you're looking at a hot water wash with some soap or detergent and scrubbing. But a lot of you guys don't have time to do that. So let's get into the big volumes, get things sanitized pretty well, I think is important. After that, we're looking at cleaning the environment. We're looking at disinfectants, as many recommended disinfectants, particularly against crypto and coccidiosis and so on. And they're very useful. They need to be put onto a clean surface. But two key things, 
we need to really watch the walls because the walls are often not sealed, particularly if they're concrete, there's little holes and pitting in them and they're not cleaned properly. So I love, I love painting walls to seal them down or good old fashioned whitewash. You can't beat it with a big stick to seal a wall, seal an area and provide a disinfectant source within a pen. That's great, Martin. And I suppose vaccination protocol on farms really come into effect when all the things that you've outlined are correct in order for them to be effective. What should farmers be considering for a vaccination protocol? Yeah, and, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and there's some uh, people look at cost and they look at inconvenience in vaccination programs. What I really, 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 really urge here and our experience and let's take our, our human experience with COVID and the concept of vaccinating populations where if we get, you know, a high proportion of the population, 80 percent plus of the population vaccinated, the likelihood of disease transmission really reduces. So the opportunity with calf vaccination in our, in our systems is huge because they're all roughly the same age because of seasonality and they're all in one group. So we can regard that as a population. So vac- vaccines can be very effective when you, when you look after all this other stuff. But if you get in there with, say, intranasal pneumonia vaccines, and there's a number of them on the market, some of them are licensed to be used from from a day of birth. And we get them in and we get good local cover. So what I mean by local cover is those vaccines will protect uh, the calf from viruses binding into those nasal passageways where the vaccine has gone in. And that works extremely quickly, you know, um, and it lasts for you know approximately three months. And these against our big players like RSV, PA3 and, and IBR, these, these viruses that vets talk about uh, so much. I would recommend anybody who's dealing with large groups of calves, will you get get that vaccine started? And then your vet can advise you on controlling things like pasturella as the calves get older. There's other vaccines that are injectables that can be used for that. So these protocols are quite straightforward and they can really help you treating and managing calves, even if you get an outbreak. The treatment improves no end if these calves are vaccinated. Moving on, Martin, when the calves are turned out to grass, what are the major health concerns for farmers to be aware of? OK, um, and look, again, this is this is a point for m- a massive discussion and probably requiring quite a bit of research and understand with Chagas and UCD. And so a lot of this stuff has been looked at. We talk a lot about summer scour syndrome where we're dealing with this transition to the grass environment. And I think we probably haven't quite pinned down the true causes, but we certainly see an impact from very, very high quality, high sugar, low fiber grasses that can cause problems as cats transition from the weaning environment. And we've seen it in many, many situations. And that can be compounded by uh, issues with molybdenum toxicity in, in reseeded young growing grass or in certain parts of the country where calves are far less tolerant of high levels of molybdenum in, in grass. Um, again, there can be acute actual copper deficiencies out here as well that give this syndrome of poor coat and scouring. So that's a very specific syndrome. And I think grass restriction and supplementation with high quality forages for as the calves transition uh, with their concentrate uh, can be very important here where we limit the level of grass involved. So there's research work ongoing on this, but that's that's one particular aspect that we need to think about more. I think be careful people kind of coming up with potted solutions for this. Oh, it's this, use this sort of drug or powder, or whatever it is. We need to be careful. You know, we need to really look at the management of the grass into these calves. OK, so that's kind of the first thing. Um, the second thing is when we're looking at grass, our basic parasites. So number one parasite that we're dealing with, obviously, is our worms out here. And we do see quite high worm burdens in young calves. So dung sampling can help you here. The calves are out a couple of weeks and give you an idea of what's going on. Um, or again, with your vet's guidance and experience, you can look at what is the dosing plan with taking in dung sampling. But also, please add another monitor. Weighing is so helpful. If we identify calves in groups that are not achieving growth rates, you know, over 0. 0.7, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 kilos a day, it would really consider dosing those weaker and poorer doing calves. So we have to think about that one. And the third one I really think about a lot is coccidiosis. So we do see outbreaks at pasture of coccidiosis. Um, and and often it, it's because of either poor management of coccidi- coccidial dosing, that we have a history out there. And often we need to give that anti-coccidial treatment when the calves are out about a week, 10 days. So we hit them at the risk point as they're picking up coccidia. 
and allows them to get a little bit of immunity to it while also controlling the reproduction of coccidia out there. So again, have a chat with your vet about correct timing. And I think quite a few of the problems with coccidia are created by no dosing is one thing, but also incorrect timing of coccidial doses. That's great. Thanks very much, Martin. Some great tips and advice there. Thanks, Catherine, very much. That's all for this week's episode. And my thanks to Martin for joining me on the show. You can catch up with all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.